grabo esta sección a new structural appraisal of the history of Marx's political theory and what is this shall I hand this out to the no question an anthropos an anthropos okay. <laughs> this is a paper about uh, Freud compared with Galton about uh, complex theory a, a, a subject uh, usually not uh, uh, frequent. So if someone is interested in establishing about a, a Spanish volume, Julian. So I come to my communication. I am a historian of physics, uh, not psychology, but uh, in any way historian. And uh, this communication is a uh, overall a uh, theoretical communication because uh, I take the um, categories of uh, history of uh, natural science and uh, apply them to the uh, history of uh, political science. Uh, this is uh, the outlook. I take the two historiographies more important, Coire and Kuhn's. In natural science, I found out that uh, their categories essentially are inf infinity and organization. I extend them to social sciences and uh, uh, I characterize Marxism and uh, liberalism, uh, Smith's theory. I uh, cope the core of Marxist class conflict uh, in past history and uh, I explain uh, the present situation when uh, uh, Marxism uh, seems uh, completely failed. Part one, the historiography of Coirin Kuhn, natural science, uh, the categories uh, structural are infinity and organization, according to me, and uh, I extend them to social sciences. This is uh, uh, called uh, New Historiography, the uh, historiography of uh, natural science of the years uh, 30s, uh, 60s, uh, uh, marked by the works by uh, Coiré and Kuhn. <coughs> the most celebrated book by Coiré is From the Closed Cosmos to the Infinite Universe. So it's very clear that the main idea is uh, infinite. Uh, essentially modern science born in uh, Western culture because it introduced this idea, infinity. This is uh, the idea of a coin. Uh, Kuhn uh, is very celebrated about uh, his book uh, about revolution, but overall about the uh, word paradigm, which was introduced in all kinds of sciences. Uh, paradigm is a strong theoretical organization, so the basic idea is uh, organization. My thesis is that these uh, historiographies are so important because they refer essentially to the foundation of natural sciences. Uh, actually, infinity and organization are not single ideas. This is a, a problem, uh, it's a difficulty. Uh, they are dichotomies. Actual infinity or potential infinity is an old distinction since Aristotle. And the axiomatic deductive organization like Euclidean geometry and uh, another kind of organization which is uh, le less known. Problem based, uh, based organization like uh, classical chemistry, no axiom but uh, a problem to discover the elements of matter. So, this uh, dichotomy, dichotomy is the choices in this dichotomy. One can characterize Newton paradigm as uh, based upon the choices of actual infinity, infinitesimal analysis, and uh, uh, Axiomatic organization is his celebrated uh, three principles of dynamics. But uh, conversely, the alternative uh, theories like chemistry 
in thermodynamics uh, are based upon uh, um, uh, um, elementary mathematics, not infinitism analysis, and uh, uh, an organization aim to solve a problem. Chemistry is uh, what, what are the uh, elements of matter, for example, special relativity according to Einstein, etc. Well, let us pass to social sciences. Eighty years ago, the celebrated sociologist Talcott Parsons suggested a celebrated list of five pattern variables constructed as polar opposites that give the range of possible decision and modus of orientation for only one social actor. <coughs> Sorry. Fifty years ago, Johan Gautung remarked that this list is incomplete. Moreover, he reduced all categories to two independent dichotomies for a social actor, only, uh, again, one social actor. Conformity, diversity, equality, disequality, disequality. Four couples of uh, choice on them are possible. Each couple determines a model of development. So one can have four models of development. By crossing together the two dichotomies, one obtains a compass which can orient our mind. I say this communication is overall theoretical in nature. Uh, I extend this dichotomy by Galton in uh, structural terms. Uh, two kinds of social infinity, I guess in structural terms, either an ever increasing number of personal relationships or an increase to an absolute mythical goal like nuclear, uh, nuclear bombs or nuclear mm -hmm. factories. Two kinds of social organization Either one organization aimed at finding out a method for solving a problem, for example, solving the problem of social justice, or one viewed by authoritative laws or power. So the dichotomy improves the definition of the four models of development. This is a, a graphical representation. The two axes are the representing the two uh, dichotomists and uh, the four models are represented by color uh, as suggested by God. Blue is the traditional one, red is the Russian uh, Soviet uh, uh, communist uh, Marxist one, yellow is the Arab model of development, uh, green is the Gandhi ecologist model of development. So uh, one can, one can uh, distribute uh, uh, countries and political movement in, in this uh, one group. Second part, characterization of both capitalism and Marxism, so the structural categories uh, uh, before defined. Uh, structural characterization of capitalism as a historical phenomenon can be made uh, through the choice of the absolute increase of money accumulation is was the first social process of infinite accumulation of something in the society. Second, the crematistic economy, as uh, Aristotle called, called it. And uh, the other choice was the uh, authoritative organization of capitalism on both populace and society. So two very clear uh, choices on this uh, uh, dichotomies. Smith's theory of capitalism uh, uh, has the same uh, choices. The choice of the absolute increase of national wealth is the title of uh, his main book, National Wealth, the target, the goal, uh, as a mythical goal, and an organization of the market by the invisible hand is a very celebrated notion of a Smith which, uh, without any regulation organized market in, in the free market. <coughs> it is actually a, an organization by the capital. Marx's theory is a very notorious uh, an alternative theory and uh, is based upon the two alternative choices. 
the organization aimed at solve a historical problem, how to overcome capitalism, very clear. And uh, uh, the other choice is to choose workers as humans, not as force work, as a capital, capitalist market considered them. So this is a, a, an alternative, not only in ideology, but also in the choices on, on the basic, uh, yes, uh, choices. Ma Marx has many merits uh, as a theory. Uh, he started a structural narrative of mankind political history. Uh, he generated a, a Marxist movement uh, uh, which was based upon the same two choices. Uh, uh, proletariat of all the world unite is uh, affirmation of an uh, interpersonal relationship and uh, the abolishing of capital accumulation is against uh, the actual infinity social action. Third part, the core of a conflict uh, of uh, in, of Marx uh, uh, class um, struggle against capitalism uh, was uh, 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 an irreducible revolutionary conflict because since uh, any two choices, potential infinity, actual infinity, as uh, incompatible mutually, also uh, Organization by action, by alternative view, view and uh, problem based organization are also uh, incompatible. The so theories of Marx and Smith are incommensurable. This gave an ideological emphasis, answers, an answer of the uh, struggle, class struggle. Uh, the conflict was irreducible, intractable. Oh, not only, uh, Marxism also added uh, the claim to be a scientific uh, uh, political theory. So he gave itself an absolute value. So no possibility of another alternative, no possibility another ideology. So this uh, conflict war was very, very strong. But, uh, uh, so in 1989, uh, the revolution, the magic word of Marxism, the revolution in Eastern countries, uh, Eastern European countries, defeated socialist societies and dis made disappear this society. So why this very strange phenomenon in the history of, at the center of Europe? This is the main problem of the modern historical history, of the historical uh, political policy. Maybe uh, this is the end of the two century conflict, uh, 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 disappeared uh, abruptly. Uh, part four, the international panorama after the year 1889. Uh, uh, is uh, uh, more enlightened by a research by these two women, Chenoweth and Stephen, a research in 2011 about a database of all the revolution in the last century. See, uh, 123. And out of them, 100 was uh, the number of non-violent revolutions in all the world. And uh, even more surprisingly, the 53% of this revolution was successful against uh, dictatorships. Whereas uh, the violent revolution, the Marxist one, were successful 24%. These are statistical data. So it's a very formidable data for uh, uh, have a point of reference for having a, a comprehension of the last decades. 
Uh, one can add that, uh, uh, the, from the four corpuses, so this one can characterize the last more important revolution. The first more important revolution were English, American, and French revolution, which very clear originated the liberal model of development. And they are surely characterized by the mythical uh, uh, goals of uh, the capitalism and uh, the organization um, uh, deductive uh, of an uh, authoritarian society. After uh, the Russian and Chinese revolution started the socialist model of development and they are the, um, characterized by the two choices. Again, the choice about the progress, but uh, the different progress uh, the different organization, an organization for solving a basic problem, the problem of justice. Uh, Iran revolution and uh, in 2011, uh, Arab Spring prepares the birth of the third model of uh, development, and the Gandhi and uh, the 18, 1989 revolution have prepared the birth of the fourth nonviolent and ecological model of development. So what is the novelty? In retrospect, uh, the last two centuries actually represents in the world the slow beginning of a political pluralism of four models of development, which were, uh, have been misinterpreted, sorry for the mistake, which have been misinterpreted Marxist model of development, the first alternative model, as the birth of an exclusive antagonism with all other, but uh, instead it was the starting, uh, uh, the beginning of uh, the pluralism of the core model of the world. Thank you for your attention. Yes, I would have to disagree with you uh, that Marxism is simply a failure and it's not irrelevant. Uh, of course, in certain ways, it failed, as you have pointed out, uh, a movement based on the proletarian class of the revolution, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Oh, okay. Sorry, can you repeat the second? The second, I have the okay. low. Uh, I said a movement based on the 19th century proletariat uh, seems very, you know, the proletariat as a revolutionary subject seems very problematic to us indeed, and it didn't work out so well historically, et cetera, et cetera. But I would also point out that um, there's been a resurgence of a very interesting Marxist scholarship. Uh, for example, Nancy Fraser, uh, who teaches at the New School for Social Research in New York City, wrote a book called Cannibal Capitalism, and I think it's actually quite an appropriate book. But I've been more interested in, okay, actually Marx did feel with ecological issues, it's not very well known, but people like the Japanese scholar uh, Koha Saito uh, wrote a book called Marx and the Anthropocene that just came out recently. And uh, what he picks up the idea of uh, metabolic rifts, which he finds in Marx. Either Marx did a whole bunch of notebooks at the end of his life. Okay, and people that haven't been published uh, until recently, and no one's read them, et cetera, you know, a few people have read them, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but it took people like Liebig, the German chemist, who was looking at the depletion of nitrogen from the soil and how that was ruining the soil in Germany. Eventually, of course, they got the, what that guano stuff from the, the bird trap and started using that as fertilizer, et cetera, et cetera. Marx was actually very well aware of what he called the metabolic rift, 
somehow capitalism uh, is really being disconnected with the ecological environment. And it actually made Marx much more pessimistic. I mean, you know, we have a stereotype about him being, uh, you know, this champion of progress, socialism is going to bring progress, et cetera, et cetera. Well, yeah, uh, those are kind of standard state ideologies of socialism. But if you want to actually look at what Marx said uh, in these notebooks, uh, he got kind of pessimistic about the destruction of the ecological system by capitalism in his later years in the 1880s. And so we need to go back to these notebooks and we need to start talking about uh, metabolic drift as one way. I'm not saying that Marxism is the only way to talk about the environment, but what kinds of interesting approaches, feminist, you know, ecological approaches, and so on and so on. But it is one way, and it's unfair to him to simply condemn him for not uh, dealing with ecological issues because he does. So let's not just come up with a bunch of cliches about Marx. Let's read him and try to figure out what he's actually saying. Read him in a critical way, not as a state bureaucratic ideologist, but someone who still has some valid critical ideas to offer us about the ecological crisis, for example. Okay, but uh, if, I, if I can help you, I think summarizing what you were saying uh, is that we should, uh, on one hand, separate what is Marxism and the ideas that circulate about Marx, which can then well, are the state you know, ideology, which of exactly. course, or we can let Marx was uh, and uh, his rich ideas. So I beg pardon for my English in a very poor. I understood uh, not not so much. The first uh, problem. You will contest that Marxism was repeated in 1989, if uh, I, don't, uh, I am not wrong. But uh, for me, it's very clear because the guerrilla is no more in, in worldwide. No more Marxist guerrilla that exists. So there are no movements uh, in this moment, apart the worker movement. I understood that uh, you think that uh, Marx was very more uh, wide in ideas than uh, the tradition. Surely, I studied also uh, ma mathematical manuscripts uh, of Marx, which are very com different from the tradition uh, of the uh, anal uh, analysis of science by Marxist uh, theorists. But uh, mm, the problem it is not uh, Marx's uh, uh, ideology; is uh, the problem of uh, Engels' uh, ideology and uh, the movement uh, ideology, the amount uh, uh, and uh, uh, historical, um, I guess, the uh, forms in which are vested the Marxism and then abandoned. So uh, the problem is more large in this sense. And uh, I consider the situation in some centers, not in uh, the last uh, decades. Some centuries, uh, uh, it's clear that Marxism is no more the only one uh, alternative in the world. This is the point. So there is a pluralism. Uh, or in, a, in other words, it's necessary to gain this pluralism against uh, a monopoly of the power in the world. Okay. Thank you. I mean, I guess my point was that Marxism should not be the only way of seeing things in the world, but it still has important contributions. We still live in a capitalist society. We still need to develop a critique of it. And Marxism is quite appropriate for that, in my opinion. So let's see a bit. Also, other inputs, questions, comments related to this issue of other? Is Marxism still alive? No. <laughs> yeah, I would Marxism. Yeah. <laughs> In part. <laughs>
a very complete and sort of symmetrical analysis that you give us, it seems that sometimes there are assumptions early on that stick in my mind and I wonder uh, what they mean. Uh, you brought up the issue of the visible hand and you said, don't take it down. <laughs> <laughs> you brought up the visit, the, the uh, idea of the visible, invisible hand, and you said it wasn't that, it was something else. And it sounded like you were saying it was some kind of dictatorial or authoritarian something or other. If there's no market, there's no capitalism, and there's no Marxist analysis of capitalism. And so it seems like you ruined the analysis right there at the beginning before you give us uh, your um, your final results. So uh, do you think there was never any market? Is that what you're telling us? Because economists today, they still believe there is a market. Uh, it is for Adam Smith that uh, there exists an invisible hand for regulating market. Because uh, Adam Smith is a liberal. He wants freedom. And no oh, one believes this today? No, because uh, yeah. as a, as a right, it was um, uh, the uh, economic idea of uh, the king of France, uh, free, uh, uh, free, ma free market, free frontiers, uh, and uh, great prosperity for all. This was the idea in the uh, 18th century. So more freedom, more uh, prosperity. It was after that, uh, uh, now, uh, United States, uh, uh, in the last uh, crisis, uh, started some control on the economy, because as a, as banks, for example, finance. Otherwise, it was, uh, <laughs> it was uh, the country of the freedom, freedom of uh, uh, economic, of uh, uh, any kind of freedom. And this is uh, the <laughs> regime of <laughs> liberal model of development, of the freedom. And the invisible hand was the uh, assurance that anyway, the market is self-regulated. <laughs> this is a miracle of Adam Smith, not of Marx. The no, but it's also the idea of of the defenders of capitalism still, capitalism still today. Ah, yes. After we know that it was the capitalism that actually regulated the situation, for example, the market of employment, uh, etc., or the, the finance. But uh, for Adam Smith, it was a freedom. Okay. Uh, let's uh, <laughs> let's give the talk the, the floor to chat and the south. Yeah, and, and then, I mean, that's far away from psychology, but it's interesting. So you're talking about the the quiet revolutions in the uh, eighty nine, and it's very really interesting true. that what happened afterwards. We are always jokingly telling about our new rich that they only read the first chapter of Das Kapital, so original capital accumulation, because that really goes on. But you're right, not in the Adam Smithian manner, but in many ways the old ruling, like in the communist countries, the old ruling classes converted their, their political power into capital very soon and very easily. Like one of the, just one example, one of the Hungarian ideological leaders, the toughest, toughest communist, a uh, relatively young guy, 40 years old. He is now, 40 years old was in 1990, he is now owning the Titan excavation rights in India. And because he was smuggling uranium to North Korea, He's stuck in Moscow, he cannot leave Moscow, but much before the Ukrainian war. For the last 15 years, he cannot leave Moscow because he's so rich, 
right? And and he was originally he was the toughest, most most conservative communist, and immediately traded his impact, went to India through Moscow. And and I would argue there was a lot of violence in people's lives, not only Romania where there was real violence, but the hurt and the suffering was not recorded, and it was terrible. Yeah. I mean, the topic science and politics <laughs> is a broad topic, and we brought a lot of uh, interesting materials up. And there was still, Dennis, as last, if you can make it short, and like the famous last yeah. words, to, and then we can continue the political oh, discussion. Good about that. Yeah, he's good. I mean, of uh, course he believed in freedom. Uh, and he had a general, remember his first book was on uh, moral sentiment. Uh, he did consider himself to be a moral philosopher. He thought that capitalism was going to be great for everyone. Uh, and, you know, everyone was going to be prosperous. It turned out he was wrong, uh, as Marx was wrong in some issues. Uh, but in any case, look at the free market policies that were applied in my country, the United States, uh, since the 1980s. They have been an utter dismal failure in almost every way that you can think of, from rampant social inequality to economic crises to the destruction of the environment. Uh, these market-oriented policies are totally and utterly Okay, thank you all for participating. It was clearly an inspiring uh, talk, provoking uh, uh, reactions, and then it was the conference about to talk in English and communicate as good as we can. Thank you all for both speakers and we continue discussions that um, uh, during lunch and afterwards. Thank you.